Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. With India caught in the relentless grip of COVID-19, we once again present an informed view from outside the country to try and understand how we got into this dreadful mess and how do we get out of it. My guest is one of the world's most highly regarded experts on global health, Professor and Dean of Brown University School of Public Health, Ashish Jha. Professor Jha, in an article you wrote for the Hindustan Times on Sunday, which unfortunately didn't get the attention it deserves because the Bengal state election results dominated the news that day, you identified four principal reasons why you believe India's caught in this dreadful coronavirus crisis. Can you, for the benefit of those who missed the article, briefly identify those four reasons? Yes, absolutely. I would be happy to. Um, so it, there, are, uh, there are several reasons why India is, finds itself where it does right now. Number one, and this has gotten a lot of attention, this, and, uh, and I think it's probably an important computer, maybe a contributor, is the rise of variants. Uh, and when I say variants, I'm thinking about two specific variants that I think are important. Uh, B117, this is the variant from the UK. Uh, and then 617, uh, B1617, this is the variant that has been first identified in India that people call the double mutant. Uh, I think both of those uh, have contributed to what we have seen as a rapid rise in cases. Uh, this is, by the way, B117, every country it has hit uh, it has caused a massive spike in cases. So it stands to reason that that has played an important role. Uh, I think the second issue is uh, relaxation of the public health standards. And you saw this uh, with people not wearing masks anymore, this kind of broader attitude of the pandemic is over. And you started just in, in when I was talking to family and friends in India in January and February and even March when cases were starting to surge. Uh, you could see people um, acting like the pandemic was over. And of course, the most kind of obvious example of this, of what I think was really a series of public health mistakes, um, was the large rallies, the Kumela, the, the bringing people together in large numbers. Kumela may end up being the biggest super spreader event in the, in the history of this pandemic, uh, because it brought so many people together from across India, and of course, those people got together, a lot of them infected each other, and then they all left and went back home and efficiently spread the virus across much of the country. So I think that's a major issue is the relaxation of the public health standards. The third, of course, uh, is the failure of the government uh, to respond in any serious way when the data was very clear. So uh, to me, as I was tracking the data, you can see by late February, that infection numbers are starting to rise quite quickly. This is late February. Now you could argue, well, maybe some people could have missed it in late February. By early to middle of March, it was extremely obvious that India was heading for a second wave. And how big a wave was really gonna be determined by what policy actions were taken. And of course, I, you know, by mid-March, there were no major policy actions. There were, uh, so even though the government had several weeks to respond, they had not. And in fact, I would argue that not until April and kind of quite a long, far along in April. Uh, so, you know, this is not a virus that lets you be two months late to respond. It punishes you for being slow. The fourth has been brought up by a few people, which I don't know how big a role it is, but I will put it on the table because it may have some, and which is about seasonality. This virus is a bit funny in how it, how it acts. But one of the things we've learned is that when humidity levels get lower, the virus becomes more efficient at spreading. And we do see when you look at, for instance, Delhi in February, March, humidity levels tend to drop a bit. And in January, February, March, it tends to be a little bit less humid a time. So at least there is some potential explanation that maybe the season also contributed Personally, I don't think the season is the major driver here. I think it's, if I had to think about the things, it's really a combination of the variants. And the, probably the single biggest driver is the complete relaxation of the public health response and the failure of the government to respond to what was then, at one point, obvious number of cases rising. I want to pick up very briefly on that point you made about the failure of the government to respond 
not just to obvious indications which were quite apparent from the first week or the second week of March, but also to advice that it was getting from its own appointed scientific inquiry committees. Yesterday, Dr. Rakesh Mishra, the former director of the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, and a member of the government scientific committee in SACO, confirmed to us in an interview, a story put out by Reuters three days earlier, that in early March, Insacog had informed the government of their high concern that new variants were proliferating and taking hold of the country. And Insacog told the government there would be an exponential rise in cases followed by hospitalizations, followed by sadly mortality. Almost exactly at the same time as the government received this warning from its own scientists, the health minister is on record claiming India has reached the end game of the virus. Doesn't that one example itself prove that A, the government was deliberately deaf to advice from its own scientists, and secondly, it had fooled itself into believing that India had defeated the virus? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know what people's motivations are, but I can look at people's actions, right? And in the actions, what you see is two things. First, this idea, which I was hearing all through January, February, of India has beaten the pandemic. I kept thinking, how can India have beaten the pandemic? No country has beaten the pandemic. Indian people are not uh, different than other humans. Uh, we are not naturally immune to this virus. It is not possible that India has beaten the pandemic when every other country is still vulnerable. So I, I was always very skeptical of that. And... It's such an extraordinary claim that in a global pandemic where every country is being hit, uh, India is the one country that has the sort of special powers to avoid it. it. With such an extraordinary claim needs extraordinary level of evidence. I hadn't seen any evidence to say that India would be spared. And second, the data by, again, as I said, late February, but certainly by early March, was quite clear that things were heading in the wrong direction. And so the failure to respond to that data, in my mind, is very concerning. I don't understand it. I do think that it is important at some point uh, for people in power to explain why they chose to ignore that data uh, and why they chose not to act and, and why it did take as long as it did to act. Uh, because I think the Indian people deserve that answer. Well, let's hope one day the Indian people get it. At the moment, just to finish that little story, the secretary in the Department of Biotechnology has actually gone on record in an interview to the Economic Times to claim no warning was given. In fact, she says that there was no basis for a warning. So not only is the government refusing to explain why they failed to act on data that was so obvious, then I actually, if her interview is a genuine reflection of the government's viewpoint, they're now claiming there was no warning. In other words, there was no data. But let's leave that controversy aside. I simply mentioned it because it proves the point you made about the government's failure to respond in any serious way being one of the four major causes for the crisis we face today. In your Hindustan Times article, you also identified four things the government must do. I'd like to take you through each of them one by one. The first was, and I'm quoting you, we have to stop the spread of the infection. And there you identified three critical steps. Can you tell us what are those three critical steps to stop the spread of the infection? <clears throat> Absolutely. So um, we've learned a lot about this virus in the last year. I mean, if you think about where we were last May versus where we are today, we know a lot more than we did. So what we know about this virus is that it spreads most efficiently when people gather in large, large groups outside or even in small groups inside without wearing a mask. That's what we know about the virus and how it spreads efficiently. <clears throat> so that's what we need to stop at this point. So what does that mean? Of course, no more large rallies. Of course, no more large gatherings outside because that would be a disaster. So that's number one. Uh, uh, along those lines, uh, I would stop all indoor gatherings. So what does that mean? Of course, people have to go inside their homes. That's fine. But 
I would close retail shops and shopping malls and restaurants, any place that draws people indoors for any extended period of time, uh, in my mind is dangerous, or it has to be very, very limited, maybe just for food and other essential services. The, the, so that's one set of things is restrictions. Now, it, that's a little bit different than a national lockdown. You can do a national lockdown and other public health people have been calling for a national lockdown. I feel like you can be targeted in your restrictions and that would work just as well. So that's kind of really number one on that. Number two is universal mask wearing. What we know from so many countries is when everybody wears a mask outside their home, it makes a tremendous difference in slowing down the spread. Masks, especially high quality masks, doesn't have to be N95s. There are other many, there are many other reasonably high quality masks, but high quality masks make a tremendous difference. And so those should be mandatory and, uh, and the government should help particularly poor people who may have a hard time accessing high quality masks, get them. So mask wearing is number two. And then last but not least is testing. And, you know, testing is an interesting thing because um, one of the things about testing that I think is underappreciated. Most people think about testing is like, you do the test to find out who has the disease. Well, of course, but tests are not just a medical intervention. They actually can be a public health intervention if you do it effectively. If you uh, do testing early in the disease course, you can actually find people before they've had a chance to spread and you can isolate them. So testing actually becomes quite an important part of the strategy. Uh, for controlling the spread of this virus. On that first point that you made about banning altogether indoor gatherings, you added a further sentence in the Hindustan Times article. You said, stop the indoor gathering of people who are not part of the same household. It's a concept that's very well understood in Britain. It's new to the Indian people. What you're saying is, if you don't live in a particular home or in a particular apartment, do not go there, and you're saying to the people who live there, do not invite people who don't belong here. In other words, households should be separate. Absolutely, and this is really critical because one of the things that we have seen in many countries, including in the United States, is when you closed restaurants, people started inviting other people over for dinner, their friends, their families. I completely understand that, that is a normal human thing. But what that was became was that that became the source of spread across the country. Households cannot be mixing with other households right now, not when the outbreak is this bad. Now, the second key step that you identified in the Hindustan Times article was the need for great care of people who fall ill. I quote from your article, you wrote, in the next four to six weeks, we will see a flood of patients at hospitals. If it's bad now, it's going to get worse. What is it that you believe the government should do for this flood of patients? Yeah, I think this is a, a point that people need to understand is that when you see somebody coming in for the, to the hospital, somebody whose oxygen level is low, somebody who's very sick, they were infected seven to 10 days before. So this is important because whatever number of infections we are seeing today, those people will need hospital care a week, 10 days down the road. And we are generating three to 400,000 known infections, known cases. Of course, my belief and all the experts out there believe that the true number of infections in India is much, much higher than four lakhs a day. It's probably somewhere between one and a half and two million cases or 15 to 20 lakhs a day, though some people think it's more than that, but that would be my best estimate. And if you think about the fact that maybe 5% of those people need hospital care, that means every single day, we may be generating a one lakh people who need hospital care. And it just continues daily. Those people keep adding in. So this is going to get, and if the hospitals are full now, as every day more and more patients come in, it's just gonna get dramatically worse. So. So the government has to get ready for this. And, I, and what I wrote, and I've been saying this for now almost two weeks, is you need a lot more hospital beds. You need a lot more oxygen. You need to make sure that you're well supplied on therapeutics. And then here's the part that you can't import, that you can't get easily, and that's people. 
you need to protect your doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers, because if they start getting sick, which many of them have gotten infected, if they start getting tired because they've been working 12, 14 hour days every day for weeks on end, they will get tired. They're humans. You can have all the beds you want. You can have all the oxygen you want. People will not get the care they need. So this has got to be a very, very aggressive effort. You know, some people have brought up the idea of whether to bring in the military to set up beds. To me, it doesn't matter what mechanism. You need a lot more hospital capacity. Let me at this point, for the sake of the audience, mention that, in fact, we do have regional lockdowns, not nationwide. Different states, different districts are declaring it for different periods of time, but it tends to be one week or sometimes two weeks, no more. The new concept about gatherings indoors that you've mentioned, which hasn't been understood in India, is the need to ensure that two households don't ever get together. This is a very important point you're making, separate households. I should also mention that there is a critical shortage of hospitals, oxygens, medicines, perhaps very soon doctors, certainly of ICU spaces. And it is true that people are now dying on pavements. We've seen those, you've seen them as well on television. And the government is responding by getting the army to set up hospitals, but there's also a limit to how much the army can do because the army medical corps exists to actually make sure the armed forces are safe. If you distract them and put them onto civilian duties, then their first primary function will not be fulfilled. Let me at this point come to your third and fourth points, because in a sense, those are things that at this moment, the government hasn't thought about. It has thought about the first two, which is some form of lockdown, some form of ramping up of medical care, but it might not have done it sufficiently. Your third point is to do with vaccination. Here you say that the government must work with the Serum Institute to overcome shortage of raw materials. And that is a critical shortage, as you point out, all over the world. What specifically do you think the government should be doing with the Serum Institute? Yeah. Um, so this is, and look, it's not just a Serum Institute, but India, of course, has a lot of capacity uh, to make vaccines. And what I have heard as I have been talking to people uh, at the Serum Institute and elsewhere is that there's a set of um, raw materials that are necessary for vaccine production that are running in, in short supply. And, uh, and vaccinations, and let me just talk a little bit about vaccinations. Vaccinations are not going to get India out of trouble over the next two to four weeks. The short term is those other things. But the medium term, once we get beyond four, six weeks, and, and how do we really pull out of this wave? And then how do we prevent the next wave, which will come if we don't act? The way you do those things is by vaccinating people as much as many people as quickly as possible. So, and, and India has no problems with the delivery of vaccines. The problem right now is production of vaccines. So my understanding of why we cannot make more vaccines in India is it's about raw materials. It's about things that the Institute needs to, to ramp up further production. That's my understanding as I have talked to people there. And those raw materials, there are many different kinds. And they're even simple things like the liner bags that go into the machines where the, the vaccines are stored temporarily as you're sort of producing them. I mean, these are simple, basic materials, but not every, not, there's not a lot of companies that make them. And here, I actually think we need a global effort, but the Indian government certainly needs to be sitting down with the Institute and saying, what do you need? Where are your roadblocks? And then how do we get other industries, other companies in India to make them? Because there may be American companies or German companies that make them right now. And the, the Indian government should be working with the Americans and the Germans and the French and saying, help us produce more of these things, get more of these things to India so that the Serum Institute can do what it needs to do. So it's got to be a very tight relationship. By the way, this is how the U.S. government did it when the Biden administration came in, our production was going okay, but not great. The Biden administration sat down with Pfizer, sat down with Moderna, with Johnson and Johnson and said, what do you need? Where are your roadblocks? What are your challenges? And then they went out and found people who could meet those challenges and help solve the problem 
It's the government and the private sector working together that solves these things. You also make one more point in that Hindustan Times article about India's vaccination strategy. You say the priority should be older people and healthcare workers. Am I right in inferring from that that you have a disagreement with the policy announced that became effective on the 1st of May in India, whereby everyone over the age of 18 now qualifies? Given that you don't have sufficient vaccines for them, and that's not a secret, was it a mistake to open it to everyone and therefore dilute the focus on the elderly and the healthcare workers? Yeah, I don't, I don't support opening it up to everyone until older people and healthcare workers have been vaccinated. Uh, what we know of this disease is that it is older people who end up uh, getting very sick and dying. If you want to relieve the pressure on hospitals, if you want to stop having people dying on pavements outside of hospitals, the single biggest thing you can do is vaccinate high-risk people. Young people will can occasionally get sick, of course, and they do spread a lot of the disease. And so there is an argument to be made around young people, but, it's, but the evidence and the, and the experience from the UK, from Israel, from the United States, from so many countries, is if you start with older people, the first thing you do is you bring down your hospitalizations. You relieve the incredible stress of, on the hospitals. And that's gotta be priority number one. And of course, vaccinating healthcare workers has the advantage of you protect them so they don't get sick. Even if they're young people, they don't get sick because when they get sick, they're out of commission. Your healthcare system can't function. So healthcare workers and elderly is what I, would, what I have argued for. That's what I think every country that's been successful has done. I would not be vaccinating healthy 23-year-olds right now, not when there are 70-year-olds who have not gotten a vaccine. Now, the fourth key thing that you believe the Indian government needs to do and do urgently to control the crisis we're in is genome sequencing. And again, I want to quote from your article. You say, the United States and UK companies are ready to ship genomic sequencing supplies to India, but the Indian government must want it and be ready to use them. I take it what you're saying, that the time has come to India for India to ask these companies for help? Yeah, look, um, the way I think about this, first, let's talk about genomic sequencing. Um, genomic sequencing is critical, to understand, is critical to understand variants. That's how you identify variants. And that's you ident how you identify where variants are spreading. The UK sequences almost 10% of its infections. The US does about 2 to 3%. I think the US should be doing a little bit more. India is doing way less than 1%. So basically, India is fighting this war with blindfolds on. It doesn't know which variants are spreading where. It doesn't know where infections are going next. This is not how you fight a war. Genomic sequencing gives you intelligence to figure out where things are heading, what's causing your problems. Given the importance of this, there are, of course, Indian companies and, and genomic sequencing capabilities in India. But you need so much genomic sequencing happening in India to really do this well, that, that you need outside help. This is fine. Countries help each other in the moments of crisis. And there are genomic sequencing companies here in the United States and elsewhere who I know are happy, willing, and able uh, to send uh, genomic sequencers to India. But you can't just send it. You need the Indian government to uh, want it, the Indian government to request it. Of course, all those clearances have to be done. This should be done urgently, and the Indian government should be very, very proactive on saying, we want to scale up genomic sequencing. And then, of course, companies can help donate those machines. Now, we're coming to the end of this interview, Dr. Jha, but there are two more things that I want to put to you. On Monday, to begin with, and then again today, Wednesday, at the government's press conference, the health ministry said that there are 12 or 13 states and union territories which are showing what they call early signs of plateauing. And the states and territories that were identified included Delhi, Punjab, Maharashtra, and UP. Now, you are someone who follows the trajectory of coronavirus in India fairly closely. So do you agree that there are signs of critical states plateauing? Or is this simply a reflection of the fact that the amount of testing has come down, therefore the amount of cases identified has come down, 
And this may be a bit of an illusion. Which of the two? Is it genuine or illusory? Yeah, I, I, I think, and maybe this is just my hopefulness getting the best of me, but I think that I too see early signs of plateauing. Um, I think those states, now, again, you have to be a bit careful for exactly the reason you laid out, which is testing is not going as well as uh, it needs to. And I'm worried about the situation with testing. So we may be overestimating uh, what's happening. But that said, when I look at the data from Maharashtra and Delhi and uh, and even UP, UP, I'm actually a bit less confident about. But Delhi and Maharashtra, what I look at and have been looking every day, I really do think that they may be plateauing. Uh, that would be really, really amazing, wonderful. The issue, of course, is India is a big country. So you can have a plateauing in Maharashtra and Delhi and UP, and, and, and that would be great. But there are many other places where things are still looking pretty tough. Once you get away from, from the uh, West and you get out more to uh, Bengal and Bihar and Charkhand and other places, uh, even in the South, there's still places where infection numbers are rising very quickly. So we'll have to do this very carefully. I think uh, no declaring victories yet. All of the public health measures need to be in place. And let me make one other point, was imagine that India does plateau at three and a half or four lakh cases a day. That is a tremendous number of new infections. Because again, with the test positivity, I'm assuming that India is generating 2 million cases a day or 2 million infections a day or or something like 20 lakhs a day. That's the true number. As long as that's the plateau, we will see, continue to see 50, 100,000, 150,000 people needing hospital, new people needing hospital care every single day. We will continue to see 10, 15, 20,000 people dying every single day. That's the plateau. The plateau just means it won't get worse than that. But I would argue that is horrendous level of suffering and in, in sort of an unacceptable level of suffering. So plateau is not good enough. We've got to bring these cases down and we've got to bring them down quickly. Can I interpret what you're saying, Philemon? There's good news in the belief, or may I say hope, that there are early signs of plateauing only because it means we're not increasing. But if we plateau, at 3 lakhs or 3.5 lakhs a day, that's not just a horrendous number of daily cases, but it also means hospitalizations and very sadly deaths will also continue at very high numbers. So there is clearly a very dark cloud around the silver lining to put the metaphor the other way around. So there's both good news and bad news there, isn't it? Absolutely. And here's what needs to be done. And here's where I'm a little bit worried about the mental models. I've been watching the models that the Indian government is looking at and what they're projecting. And in their mind, as I have seen it, and as I have heard their experts, um, they have this idea that, of course, cases went up very fast. They're assuming that cases are going to fall very fast. First and foremost, I really, really hope they're right. We all hope they are right. But I am worried that that is not what is going to happen, that we will hit this plateau and then we will very slowly meander down. And what is going to happen is that for weeks and weeks and weeks, we will just continue seeing floods of patients get sick and die. And, uh, and the chronicity, the long-term effects of this you, is going to be that you're going to see the collapse of the health system, that people will not be able to get care they need, not just for coronavirus, but all the other needs that people have. So I am very worried about the next month, six weeks. It certainly May is going to be a horrendous month for, the, for our country, for India. Uh, June, I think, is going to be a very bad month. If things go well, if all the things that I have talked about, other public health people have talked about, are done, in June, things should start feeling like, oh, yeah, Cases have come down, hospitalizations are starting to ease a bit if everything goes well. But it won't really be until July or, or even August until things start getting back to some new version of normal. One last question, Professor Jha. We've discussed in detail how in March, sorry, in February and early March, when there were clear signs, including advice from the government's own scientific advisory community, 
that there was a second wave in the offing and that the cases could rise exponentially. At that point of time, the government was blind and deaf to the advice and the data and didn't bother, continued as if India was going to defy the world and somehow beat the virus. However, today, Wednesday, the government's principal scientific advisor said at the press conference, there will be a third wave. We're bang in the middle of the second. No one knows when the second will end. And he's already publicly admitted a third wave is inevitable. Is that a good sign that we are at least now beginning to accept a reality? And even though we're not over the second and who knows how long the second will last, but the government is already admitting there will be a third thereafter and we need to prepare for it. Does that suggest that there is reality dawning on the government? Yeah, I, I have you know two things. First is it is really good to see this acceptance that India is not an exception to the world, that India is and the Indian people are susceptible to this virus as every other population in the world is. I think that is, it's good and it's important to understand. And it's always good to prepare for a third wave. I mean, first and foremost, we just have to get through the second wave. And we are still early in the second wave here. We are not anywhere near done, my gosh. So it's fine to acknowledge that and of course, prepare for it. I believe on the other hand, that it is possible to avoid the third wave. How do we do that? By vaccinating people. If we can get, and I'm going to lay out a number that everybody is going to say, oh my God, how will we do this? If we can get 500 million more Indians vaccinated, I think we prevent a third wave. I think there will be no third wave. I mean, maybe there might be a third little bump, but there will be no third wave. 500 million is a lot, of course. So no, I'm not, it's not lost on me how hard this will be. Um, but I think it is doable. I think India has the capability and the Indian government, once we get through this horrendous time, mm -hmm. should put all of its resources. The central government has to lead here. This is not a state thing. We have to put all of our resources, efforts, energy into making enough doses to vaccinate people. Two quick, small clarificatory questions. When you say that one way of perhaps avoiding a third wave is if 500 million Indians can be vaccinated, do you mean with a single shot, or do you mean with both jabs? And secondly, does that figure of 500 million include the 160 million that already have had one jab, or is it on top of that? Good question. I mean, on top of that, 500 more, 500 million additional Indians need to get vaccinated. And I think one jab alone is fine for now. Look, the UK shut down their horrible outbreak that they had in December, January, by doing a one-shot first strategy, where they vaccinated more than half their population with a single shot, and now they're going back and giving the second shot. I think that's a very good strategy for India. One shot gets you a lot of the protection. And so if India says, okay, we will make 500 million doses and give 500 million people their first shot, and then over time, we'll go ahead and give them the second shot, I think that would be a fine strategy. Then let me very quickly ask you, the UK is giving the second jab in the case of AstraZeneca eight to 12 weeks after the first. The Indian government initially insisted on a four week gap. Now they've made it an eight week gap. But to hit that figure of 500 million more, should the Indian government accept and do what the UK is doing and what incidentally the WHO has officially advised and make sure that the second jab is somewhere eight to 12 weeks later. Should we extend the gap? I think we should. I think that uh, something closer to 12 weeks actually probably is the optimal time. So it's even from a biology and immunology point of view, uh, it's probably better to do it closer to 12 weeks than to do it close to eight weeks. Uh, and of course, it opens up the possibility of getting more people their first jab before you're giving a lot of people their second. So I would go to 12 weeks uh, and I would just vaccinate as many people with their first jab as possible. Thank you very much, Professor Jab. I hope the Indian government hears you. I hope they heed your advice. I know that the Indian people will be watching very carefully because you've said a lot that is potentially reassuring at a time when the situation looks not just grim and gloomy, but even terrifying. 
And that is, there are early signs we could be plateauing, but the dark cloud around that silver lining is that if you plateau at three or three and a half lakh cases a day, that's not just a horrific number on its own, but it also implies a very large number of severe illnesses and a very large number of deaths. And the answer to avoid the third wave is vaccinate 500 million more. It doesn't matter if they've only had one jab and to make sure they all get that one jab, extend the gap between the first and second injections to up to 12 weeks. Those are critical things which I hope the government listens to. Thank you very much for joining me. Take care, stay safe. Thank you very much for having me back and stay well and stay safe. And I look forward to our future conversations. So do I. Thank you very much indeed.